So this is Badlands National Park in South Dakota. And it was created back in 1929 as a national monument. And then in 1978, it was designated as a national park. And it's, it's almost 250,000 acres. And it's got a long history um, and some really interesting geography that make it a tremendous place to photograph. From a geological standpoint, the Badlands is just tremendous. And, and if you're a geologist, it's a really fun place to go. Um, the pinnacles and spires were created through sort of two processes. Um, way, way back in the beginning of time, in the uh, late Cretaceous period, there were a lot of volcanic eruptions, lots of uh, sediments deposited from a volcanic ash and it sort of covered the entire countryside there and then 30 to 40 million years ago there were floodplains and rivers and this deposited more sediment starting around 500,000 years ago so still a ways back um, their erosion, erosion began and these sediments began eroding and so the erosion of the the stream sediments and the volcanic ash and the layers get revealed uh, as well as the hard rock underneath creates just tremendous pinnacles and sculpture and some of this erosion can be really fast in some cases it can be an inch a year and other places it goes much more slowly so that's the geology and geography of the Badlands there's also an interesting history to the Badlands and from about 11,000 years ago, it was a Native American hunting ground. And uh, they would hunt bison and the antelope and the other animals on, on the plains that were down the Badlands. And they would kind of look out over the top and see them uh, and, and figure out where they were going to um, coordinate their hunt from the high grounds. And then in the mid-1800s, uh, we had the arrival of the American homesteaders into this part of South Dakota. And the biggest problem with homesteading, and in those days it meant you were doing some wheat farming and cattle ranching, uh, is that because of the high latitude, uh, the, the tremendously long winters, the, the badlands from a farming and grazing uh standpoint is not very high productivity and, and so it took what what you would normally need to sustain a cattle in terms of acreage required three times more or so if you're in the badlands and by the 1930s when the dust bowl occurred most of the homestead in the badlands were abandoned now let me just bring up a map here kind of show you where we're at on the map so this is the United States if you're not joining me from the US this is what it looks like and this little dot on the map in southwestern South Dakota is where Badlands National Park is and we zoom in on that the pointer is on the town of Wall and the Badlands National Park encompasses all of, all of those areas in green to the south and west and there's lots of different areas and then you can see in the gray area below are our Native American Indian reservations as well. So the Badlands is huge, but for the most part, most of the um, stuff that we do occurs on the loop road there where it says 240. Um, that's the predominant loop that you can drive through uh, as a bypass off Interstate 90 if you're ever driving through South Dakota. Now when we go to the Badlands, when um, our base camp is in Wall, and Wall is a tiny little town, but as soon as you arrive in, uh, in South Dakota, and even before you arrive in South Dakota, even if you're coming from Nebraska or other places, you'll start seeing signs for the high point of Wall, South Dakota, which is a place called Wall Drug. And this is where you can find the famous jackalope um, and get photographed with it. And you can also meet and hang out with the locals at Wall Drug. I don't recommend trying to, to uh, get a date. And it's also a very popular spot for stopping for the bikers that come through on their way to the annual biker rally in Sturgis, which is just north of Rapid City, South Dakota. But I don't go to the Badlands to 
take pictures of bikers, although you could certainly do that. It's a popular stop. I go there for photography. And my first trip to the Badlands was in 2005. I was participating um, as a, a member of Nikonians on their annual photo safari. And I went there. It was in the fall of 2005. And it was just truly amazing to see this place because it was like stepping out into another planet. Um, it, it really was kind of like, you know, looking around expecting to see aliens or the Mars rover. And so I went there in 2005 and started thinking about going back. And in 2011, I started going back, um, leading my own groups there. And this whole presentation today is kind of a story about the kind of photography and the growth you can make at a, as a photographer by you know, not only finding an interesting location, but returning to it multiple times. Now, when I first went to the Badland, the whole, the whole idea was, as a landscape photographer, was to take photographs of these amazing vistas that you get, like here, um, looking out at the moon, coming up over um, a place called Panorama Point. Uh, in the middle of Badlands National Park. And this was an image that I captured on my first trip there in, in 2005. You can just see all the stripes and the rocks and really interesting topography and scenery. And the vistas, especially at this place called Panorama Point, are just tremendous. I mean, you just get these views and you just feel like you are just part really small, just part of the landscape. You're just a, an insignificant human in this great expanse of tremendously uh, diverse and incredibly textured landscape. So it's really cool. And, and this was another shot that I got on that same trip, on my first trip to the Badlands in 2005. Now, that first trip that I, that I took, I mentioned it was in the fall. Um, the fall in the Badlands is nice. The The weather is usually mild. It can get pretty darn hot there in the summer. But all of the vegetation was brown. Um, and so you had lots of, um, uh, you know, just brown, dead prairie grass. Now, I went back and for the first time with a group in 2011, and I went in the spring, early summer. And here's that same location. You can see the green prairie grasses have all grown in and it can get quite lush and thick sometimes. Um, so this was 2011. And again, I went there with the aspirations of capturing these sweeping panoramic landscapes. This one is a, uh, a panorama. Here's another view from 2012 of that same formation that was out in the distance ca captured in, in 2012. And again, what I really love about this place is that if you like to shoot panoramas, whether you want to stitch them or just crop, you've got a high megapixel camera or something like that. You can do that by, um, uh, you know, just going out there. There's no shortage of landscapes for this. And if you time things right, you can also capture things like the full moon. So last year in 2014, we went and we had a full moon rise coming up um, over one of the trails and it can just lend itself to some really fantastic landscape photographs. You can also catch the moon going down. So here's a shot that I got using a telephoto lens, um, the setting full moon over a place called the Pinnacles Overlook. And this, so this was before sunrise uh, during the, the, the late twilight. But landscapes aren't what's all in the Badlands, although that's mostly what I go there to photograph. You can also photograph wildlife in the Badlands. So here's a, a bison and a little burrowing owl that took off and just happened to be lucky enough to get captured in one of my images last year. So if you go to the Badlands, you can bring a telephoto lens as well as your landscape kit um, and look for some wildlife. Although there are better places in South Dakota to see things like the bison, there are still some pretty cool photographic opportunities. So here's a bison. Uh, notice how lush and green the prairie grasses are. This was in June of last year. You can also see a lot of bighorn sheep. There's some well-known spots. So here's a, uh, a mother with its, with its um, 
calf. And then smaller critters are around too. You can find chipmunks. This was an image that I captured in 2005 on that first trip. You can see birds like western meadowlarks. And there's no shortage of prairie dogs in South Dakota, so you can go there too. Other things we've come across on our trips to the Badlands have included things like wild turkeys, and they're out there, and that's pretty cool to see. And sometimes, if it's been a wet year, you can even see amphibians. So last year, I happened to come across this little critter, a Woodhouse's toad, out in the middle of what would otherwise have seen uh, just sort of a barren landscape. Another element to the Badlands, if you go in the spring, and in South Dakota, spring really means uh, late May. It can be really quite cold there until the end of May. Uh, through middle to end of June just depends on the season, the time of year, and what happens. Just There's been dry years, there's been wet years. But here's a prairie cone flower, really nice. You can get close-ups of these if you, have a, you want to do some macro photography, you can. There's lots of other flowers, so here's some after a rainstorm. They got kind of, they didn't weren't stepped on, but they kind of got smushed by by uh, rain and hail. And then you can incorporate the landscape into your into your vegetation and flower shots. Uh, so here's one where you've got the cool rock formations in the background in a close up. And I shot this with a super wide lens, something like a 16 to 35 millimeter lens. I captured this image. Other other flowers, you can get thistles, and they make great for close-ups. Plus, there's always usually insects hanging out. So if you look closely in this image, you can see some little uh, uh, flies and other insects hanging out amongst the, the flowers. And then you can also incorporate the foliage and the flowers and the blooms into your landscape photos. So here was a sunset shot from last year that I got, but we had the tremendous field of of uh, I think this was goldenrod. Now, as I mentioned, I've been going back to the Badlands now since 2011. Um, every year, every spring, I go, and the more time I spent fo going back to the same place, I had to start thinking about different ways and different approaches to get creative with my shots. I mean. There's only so many landscape panoramas you can do. Now, obviously, year to year, you'll get different conditions and, and you never know what you might get. But I started really using this as a proving ground for all kinds of creative techniques that I had learned um, and wanted to learn more about uh, over the years. So things you can do in the Badlands just the landscape itself is so well suited for exploring elements of photography. So you can look at light and color. You can explore textures, shapes, and forms. And also, if you happen to be there when you get uh, interesting clouds or atmospheric conditions, their thunderstorms can be quite powerful out there. And while you don't want to get caught in one, they can be pretty uh, enjoyable to photograph. Uh, the atmosphere can be incredible sometimes. And then there are a lot of techniques that you can use in your photography at the Badlands uh, to incorporate creative ideas. So things I've done over the years as I've explored and grown as a photographer have included high dynamic range, HDR, long exposure photography, so using neutral density filters to do really long exposures, infrared photography, and even playing around with, with time-lapse. But usually the first thing we'll explore when we come into the Badlands is just looking at light. And it is just an amazing location to explore light. So here we have the, the late afternoon sunset appearing at the pinnacles, um, a shot I captured in 2011. And you can just work here for as long as the light allows you to. Um, and you can use everything from a wide angle lens to a super telephoto lens, depending on what you want to capture. So here's another one where we've got the, the colors and the light hitting the, the rock formations. This was a view from a place called the Cliff Shelf Overlook. It's near the visitor center in the Badlands National Park. And then if there are clouds, you can sometimes get really interesting light. So last year, I was just driving through sort of middle of the day and it was kind of a, an overcast day, but 
I was rewarded by finding a, a brief moment where the sky kind of opened up and let the light come through and just illuminate this area called the pinnacles. And so everything else was pretty much in shadow except for that one spot and that was really cool and it just lent itself to making some really interesting captures for the brief time that it was there. You can also do more traditional things like explore silhouettes. So here is sunrise at a place called Door Trail. Capturing the sun, I use a telephoto lens here and I deliberately exposed it to get the silhouette in the rock formations. You can also do more traditional sunrise and sunset pictures. It all just depends on if you've got good clouds. So this was looking out the opposite direction from where all the wonderful rock formations were at Panorama Point. This is mostly looking out just over the prairie, but you get the sun going down over the horizon. Lately I've been exploring other ways of capturing light and one of those techniques has been to use an um, infrared camera. So this is a camera that I've had modified to capture infrared light. And last year was um, the, the second year where I've had an infrared camera at the Badlands. So here is late afternoon light and when you, use an after, uh, when you use an infrared camera this is really cool because not only do you get the light hitting the rocks but you can see the crepuscular rays there in the sky and all of the vegetation becomes really brightly toned. So I converted this to black and white and uh, you can see just how the vegetation looks so bright and so white and it just created wonderful contrast by making this a monochrome image. Here's another image that I captured with infrared and you know one thing about infrared is you can shoot in the middle of the day and still get interesting results. So this one I processed to have a grainy look but again the vegetation in the foreground almost looks like it's snow or something like that. Because my camera is um, happens to be a color infrared camera you can also work creatively this way. So this is a spot that I always go to on my workshops. It's, it's not inside the National Park uh, proper. It used to be a town. It's now just a few railroad ties and some old foundations. But there's this old car out there in a place called Kanata. And uh, I captured it in infrared last year and you can just see how much vegetation was around this car. This was all green lush but it's rendered this really interesting bluish white tone. The Badlands is also about capturing color. Now if you go to the Badlands, most people drive through in the middle of the day and it really doesn't look all that exciting. However, the, um, the best time to shoot in the Badlands is going to be before and after uh, sunrise and sunset. So right at twilight, even in the blue hour and right before sunrise, you can get some amazing shots. So here is one that I captured just as the sun was starting to come up. I got this one at a place card called Door Trail. It's where it's just one of my favorite spots because you can walk out here onto the rocks and um, it, it's just an amazing place and it really is like stepping out into another planet. Um, the sun was just barely up and this particular image um, I captured with a Nikon D4 and I and I did use HDR here but only to just capture m more richly the colors and tones and bring out the textures. So the sun was just starting to hit the rock formations at the upper right while the remaining area were still in pretty blue deep shadows. Last year when I was in the Badlands not only was there wonderful vegetation but we had some overcast. So there are some places where the the minerals in the soil from the volcanic and sedimentary deposits have been exposed and you get these wonderful yellow and red colors. Um, those really come out after a rainstorm and in this particular case we had really overcast conditions and it was clearing but those overcast conditions really made the colors in this image pop out and then combined with the green vegetation and the yellow flowers it made for some really interesting colors to explore. So here's Panorama Point again. One of the things about 
the Badlands is that when you process your pictures, you can take things that look kind of dull, uh, but if you've captured them at twilight when the light is not harsh, whether it's just right at sunset or even into the blue hour, you can really bring out a lot of colors in the sky, like in these clouds and in the rock formations. So here's another one. Again, this was taken after the sun had set. And by working with those colors and textures, you can really bring out the banding and the colors and the patterns in the rocks. It's really tremendous. Here's another one from, again, before sunrise. So this was blue hour. The sun had not quite come up, so we're right before sunrise. You can sort of see the orange on the horizon. And again, the clouds make this happen along with the completely uh, alien-looking landscape in the foreground. So you got to get up pretty early in the Badlands in South Dakota in the summer to get out there for blue hour. In most cases, sunrise is right around 5 in the morning. And so a lot of these shots were captured at quarter to five, 20 to 5 a.m. So we're getting out pretty darn early. I can't say that it's a fun experience to have your alarm clock go off at 4 a.m., but it's rewarding when you capture the colors and of the blue hour like this. And again, you can also wait till this one was after sunset. So the sun had already gone down. It looked like there was nothing else. Um, I captured a panoramic image, but the blue and the deep blue color in the sky at twilight contrasts with the reds and oranges in the rock formations and it makes for a wonderful landscape image. Those are kind of the traditional things that landscape photographers like to do but we can also explore texture and form. So there's just tremendous ways of capturing this and you can do this with medium telephoto lenses wide-angle lenses. Here what I really liked was the light. This was again just as the sun was coming up out at Door Trail last year in 2014. The light was starting to hit the rock formations. It was still blue hour type of conditions behind us and we get the light and the textures playing along the foreground and leading your eye into the spires in the back. But you can also do things like zoom in. Just look for patterns and textures in the rocks, in the erosion, and, and just have fun with that. That's something you can do middle of the day if you want to. And another way I like to explore texture and form is by using monochrome. So here we have an image that I didn't really like. Just, it was kind of blah in terms of color. It was okay, but all those oranges um, get kind of redundant. So I converted it to monochrome. And by doing monochrome here, I'm capturing a study in light and in texture. So it's really quite fun sometimes to play around with this technique and just convert things to black and white uh, and throw away distractions of color and focus on things like textures. Again, here's another shot that I did using a telephoto lens to zoom in and just look at the exploration of the light and the textures on these rocks. And then sometimes you just find interesting things. There's lots of opportunities for close-ups. Here's a fossil uh, mollusk, a snail of some kind, that's on the clay. And this soil is really kind of like clay. And if, you've, if you can imagine, after a rainstorm, having to walk in kind of wet plasticine, wet modeling clay, that's kind of what it like. it's like. It really globs up on your boots. But you can find all kinds of interesting fossils. Um, and this was one that I found and just did a quick close-up of. And you, uh, I like how the textures here are in the clay. The thing that really makes the Badlands shots interesting, though, are when you can work with atmosphere and when you get clouds. Um, that is something that you can never predict, obviously. But it is one of the reasons why I travel to the Badlands in June. In early June, the weather is still quite unpredictable and spring-like. You can get thunderstorms, you can get fog, you can get all kinds of stuff. It can be raining. And while that can make it a challenge uh, in terms of you know, going out there and, and photographing things in fog, if you get really great clouds, it can turn 
uh, an otherwise okay shot into something truly dramatic, especially if you've got a wide angle lens. Now this is overlooking Kanata Basin. You can see in the foreground there those yellow and red mounds as the road goes through. And the sun had just come up um, and was hitting the the formation of the pinnacles um, in the background there. But we got these tremendous clouds this morning. Uh, and I used a 16 to 35 millimeter lens and really made the sky the dominant element here. So the colors, bringing out the colors as the light started to pink up in those clouds really makes a tremendous shot. And these conditions are incredibly transient. I mean, if you're lucky, you might have this kind of light for five or six minutes and then it's gone. So the best thing you can do is get out there and, and wait for it and you never know what's going to happen in another 10 minutes. And I mentioned fog. Last year out in the out at uh, the Badlands there was just all kinds of crazy fog rolling in. And so here was um, Kanata Basin uh, again, those yellow mounds, and and this was a uh, a two-shot panorama. So I stitched together two images to make it more of a uh, traditional five by four um, uh, aspect ratio. But again, you can see how the fog in the background creates this really interesting uh, feeling of depth and mood. So one of the things landscape photographers always like to tell you is look for layers look for any time you can find layers and if you look through here and we count all those layers you know there's probably six or eight of them and then the fog in the background gives us that sense of depth it works well for monochrome too you can do black and white and convert to um, monochrome and then you can look at the clouds as shapes and forms as they interplay with the rock formations in the foreground. So this is a place called Castle Trail and we had some really nice light but I took this photograph, it was probably 10 in the morning. We had finished our morning uh, sunrise shooting and we just had nice nice light but it wasn't anything fancy so I made it black and white and that again allows me to accentuate the textures and the shapes of the clouds. And when you get storms you can get really lucky. So we went out to Door Trail last year looking for a sunrise and instead we got a thunderstorm. So this was a, an image, you can just see the sun starting to peek through and you can see the rain out there on the horizon. This is a HDR capture, plus or minus two stops. And I did that simply to retain the color and texture and quality in the foreground. The thunderstorm was was pretty cool to watch, and there was lightning. Um, unfortunately, we, the lightning had subsided by the time we really got set up, so we were unable to capture any lightning. But hey, that's what next year's for. In 2011, we were in the middle of this thunderstorm, and it was starting to hail, and we were really afraid we were going to have to pack it in for the evening. But that storm started to clear, and when it did it stopped raining and we got out of the cars and we were treated to the this most amazing scene and so this was Pinnacles Overlook which is very close it's the nearest stop um, when we get into the park from from Wall where we stay um, I have worked with this image since 2011 this was one that I captured uh, deliberately as HDR and no matter how many times I processed it seemed to me that I, I couldn't quite get something that looked really natural. Well, I went back and tried it again just the other day by taking two frames and merging them in in Photoshop just using the Photoshop HDR uh, tone merge. And instead of processing it in Photoshop with all the tone mapping and all the craziness, I saved it as a 32-bit image and was able to process it using the normal tools in Lightroom. And the result was really pleasing to me because I get still the drama and impact of of this of the HDR image. I mean, this is an impossible shot. I'm shooting directly into the sun, and in order to capture those those rays of light piercing through the clouds, I I have to have you know a foreground that's essentially black. So this is plus or minus three. 
uh, or I think this is m minus 3 EV and 0. Either way, it's uh, two shots blended together using Photoshop HDR and then processed in Lightroom. But you, you get the impact and feeling of what it's like to be out there looking over this tremendous landscape and having the, the sun just starting to break through the clouds. And this was just, this was the last evening of the workshop that we did. And everybody came back to the hotel uh, with just a huge smile on their face because we knew we had captured this incredible moment. Lately, I've also been exploring other ways to capture clouds. And starting um, in 2013, I started exploring using solid neutral density filters to make long exposures. And I use, um, I have a 10 stop and a 5 stop um, solid neutral density filter and sometimes I use just one and sometimes I combine them to get 15 stops. This is a 54 second exposure and these clouds were moving fairly quickly um, after sunrise, um, after we shot the sunrise at the door trail in 2013. Uh, and I processed this this photograph to really accentuate the colors and the textures. And so what I love about a long exposure is that it allows me to capture uh, a dynamic element and add this feeling of movement in an otherwise static image. To capture this sense of passing time is really quite fun. And you never know what you're going to get. So this was a 54 second exposure. Here's another one. This was with um, uh, a, this was in darker conditions. This was a 130 second exposure using a 10 stop neutral density filter. It was fairly overcast, but those clouds were moving over Kanata Basin, and I didn't really like the way the colors were, so I converted this one to monochrome again, using that technique of black and white to remove what could potentially be distracting colors and allow the viewer to focus on the textures and the form. And you can just get this idea of the streaks of clouds passing over. Here's another one from Door Trail. And what I really like about this was that um, not only we had the moving clouds, this was a 70 second exposure, so just over a minute. What I really like about um, being able to post-process these after the fact is that there's a lot of textures and colors that are really subtle. Like what, what I would like to draw your attention to in this particular image is that sort of orange path creating an inverted Y going along the bottom. This is kind of like where you know rain had passed through. It was you know uh, after a rainstorm, flash flood of some kind. You can imagine that the water was going through there, and it just eroded things slightly differently to bring out that orange. And I was able to bring out those colors and those textures in my post-processing, whereas the out-of-the-camera shot wouldn't have been nearly as, as flattering to the scene. Your eye is really able to perceive a lot of subtleties in color that the camera just can't deliver. The camera is just kind of this neutral observer. It doesn't have a brain inside it like our brain. So even though you can think of your eye as a camera, your brain still interprets the the images that your that your eye produces. And so by post processing this and this one I used a plugin called um, Tonality or not Tonality, excuse me. I used a plugin called Intensify Pro from Mac Fun Software. It's a Mac plugin and it lets you play with colors and it lets you play with um, all kinds of different ways of adjusting detail and textures. Um, but I feel like that's an important element of any photography workflow because it's not just important to show the image um, that the camera saw. It's important to deliver an image that makes the viewer have a feeling that it was like that you saw. So it's our job as photographers through post-processing to impart the feeling of the scene as you felt it and you saw it when you were looking through your viewfinder. And the feeling that you get and what your brain perceives is just not the same as what the camera 
sensor perceives. So the, all of these techniques that I've been playing around with, I've just found that the Badlands has been a tremendous proving ground for those techniques. Um, so everything that I like to learn about, um, I like to put into what I call my digital toolkit, my digital camera bag that extends beyond just using different lenses and cameras. Being able to try long exposures, infrared, uh, HDR, and refine those techniques so that I can apply them to deliver images that do justice to the way that I felt at 5 in the morning in the Badlands in this amazing place. Uh, it's what I really enjoy being able to do as a photographer. Now the cool thing about going to South Dakota, even though it's kind of in the middle of nowhere, is that there's lots of other places to take side trips to. Um, some of these you can do just within a few miles of the Badlands. Other ones require a bit of a drive. So here's that old car. This is an HDR image at twilight. Uh, that old car in the ghost town of Kanata. Um, so that's a cool place to go. Another place to visit is just outside the eastern entrance to the park is a place called the Prairie Homestead. And the Prairie Homestead is a authentic sod house. So it's a sod house. It's carved into the, the side. This is actually the chicken coop of the sod house. But there's all these... Um, uh, there's the grass growing on top, there's farm equipment, there's prairie dogs there, there's everything. And uh, it's just a fun place to explore. You can go there, they have a little museum. You can even dress up in period clothing if you're, if you're so inclined. They have costumes that people can wear. Um, so this is one, I, I really liked how this one came out in monochrome. Here's an infrared image that I captured of a, a pair of red long johns on the, on the uh, clothesline. And uh, unfortunately, with my infrared camera, I'm not able to do uh, long exposures. It's not, it's not an easy thing to do. So in this one, um, in addition to processing it with um, uh, my normal uh, raw processing, I ran it through a plugin called Analog Effects Pro 2, which allows me to add like a motion blur. And I added that to just create a little drama through plugins in the, in the clouds. And you can go into the sod house. And if you go in the sod house, it's awesome for things like HDR. So you don't have to do the, the, the realistic. This is a more artistic HDR looking out the window inside the sod house. And there's all kinds of stuff in there from uh, the 20s and 30s. This is the, they got the butter churn. And, and I think this is like a, uh, a scale or an apple peeler. There's all kinds of stuff in there, jars of preserved things and, and, and a piano. And there's just all kinds of opportunities to go in there and do close-ups um, subject. It's just a, it's a really cool place. Another interesting side trip is a quote-unquote ghost town. It's the town called Scenic, South Dakota. And it's about a 45-minute drive from Wall. And here... Um, is the first stop on the way to a, the southernmost part of the Badlands, a place that um, I only just scouted out for the first time last year. It's got more of the rock formations, dramatic cliffs. But here's this old town, and you know, depending on what kind of weather you get, it's also perfect for things like this. This is an HDR capture that I deliberately processed to have a painterly look. I also had an infrared camera so there's the old saloon and the wagon wheel on the side and the vegetation and so this one's an infrared capture I mentioned the saloon it's really kinda cool it's been around since 1906 uh, it's got all these um, um, bison and cattle skulls on it um, and you can just have fun usually when when we're at a place like this it's in the middle of the day so you're not getting the best light um, so you can have all kinds of fun with, with funny processing. And so this one I used a combination of HDR plus Analog Effects Pro 2 to give it that kind of glass plate um, look and make it look like it was captured with some kind of old school funky camera. If you do go to the Badlands, it's about, oh, I would say an hour and a half drive, you can get into the Black Hills. And that's a whole other place to explore. 
the Black Hills of South Dakota. This is in um, uh, this is Sylvan Lake in Custer State Park. And uh, if you've ever seen um, some of the movies for um, um, where the, where they have Mount Rushmore and they go over the lakes, so um, these places often pop up in in movies but this was again that tranquil sunrise this is another image that i used hdr and i captured this in 2005 and and i like this image i keep coming back to this image just because i like the reflections i like the colors but but here's one of the things i learned about about capturing images i i shot bracketed exposures in 2005 because i was just playing around with HDR and in those days HDR meant you had to put them into Photoshop and do crazy things with tone curves and it was really hard to do I didn't throw away any of those pictures um, it is now almost 10 years later since I captured this image and I was able to go back and take some of the frames and reprocess it and get a far more realistic and much more pleasing result by just tone mapping it using the 32-bit processing um, on a on a 32-bit image that I saved from Photoshop and processed in Lightroom, like that other one I, I mentioned earlier. So, just the moral of the story here is that don't throw your shots away because you never know what kind of software advances you're going to get in five or ten years that might allow you to, to recover. So, shooting in RAW and, and capturing images and, and not throwing them out just because well, it didn't work, um, just hang on to things. You never know what you're going to be able to do. You never know what you're going to be able to learn in the future. And if I hadn't been experimenting with HDR, I, I would have had a bunch of, you know, just kind of mediocre shots that I couldn't have done much else with. Of course, the Black Hills is famous for the heads, uh, Mount Rushmore. This was captured right at sunrise in 2005. Um, Mount Rushmore is one of those places that um, I... I wanted to see just because um, I didn't have any high expectations of it, but I think you know if you're in the area, you should go to Mount Rushmore. Well, it's very cool. Uh, it's really fun to see, and it's one of those places that you kind of have to see it in person to really appreciate. Another thing you can do uh, driving through the Black Hills is you can go up through Sturgis through Spearfish Canyon. And last year, I took a little side trip on an off day, and we stopped at this bar and grill called the boar's nest and it was great it had all of these antique cars they were still not even open for the summer season yet they were going to be opening in another week or so but they they let us in they let us set up our tripod and take some pictures and i used hdr here because i wanted to capture the neon um and 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 create an artistic look to this really cool um bar and grill it was just really really fun to shoot if you're willing to take a little bit farther of a drive, go a little over two hours, you can get to Wyoming. And in Wyoming, you will find Devil's Tower National Monument. And if you're familiar with Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you know this is where the, the alien spaceship was. And uh, I took a little side trip there. It, it's a fun place to walk around. Um, I got there after a crazy thunderstorm. and uh, But as a result, the light was soft. All the vegetation was really green and fresh. Lots of wildflowers. And uh, you can hike up around it. It's, it's pretty cool. So these are basalt columns that have formed from an um, ancient uh, volcanic formation. So lots of things to do in that area. And um, it's, just, it's just a fantastic place. I mean, I just realized that I can drive from where I live here in Colorado to be in in um, Badlands National Park in, in about eight and a half hours or so, give or take, depending on how many times I want to stop along the way. There's lots of places to see along the way. It's fun to take a road trip. Um, I go back every year, and it's just it has just become my favorite place to, to photograph um, because even though I've been there, this will be my fifth consecutive year, um, it doesn't get old. There's there's either different weather, different vegetation, uh, different animals, and you just never know what kind of light you're going to get. So no matter what kind of photography you like to do, whether it's the traditional landscape or more creative and abstract, there's something about the Badlands that just keeps drawing me back. And I will be going back this year with my 
partner in crime, Deborah Sandage, uh, taking a small group June 7th through 12th. So I encourage anybody who's interested in um, wants to get small group instruction. It's limited to eight people. This is the most we take, and there's two instructors. Uh, it's a lot of getting up early and a lot of staying out late. But we meet fun people. We see tremendous stuff, and uh, we hope for really great clouds. And so um, the Badlands is just, it's just a, a great place to go.